How's everybody doing? You guys good tonight? Everybody awake? Awesome. Hey, we are back into our series tonight, uh, looking at the seven letters in Revelation, and uh, we're gonna be looking at the final church tonight, the church of Laodicea. Uh, everybody ready to go? Everybody awake? All right, this is gonna be really good. Uh, one of the things that I've realized is how much the specific details of each city have played into what uh, the message in the letter to that church has said. Like Jesus is not just throwing out generalities here. He's being really specific to where people are, really individual to where people are, and I love that. I love that when Jesus speaks to me, He's not just throwing out there these general blanket statements. He's saying, Jeremy, like, you're my son. I love you. Like, isn't that a blessing Amen. as Christians? Some of you guys, you're not sure yet. Isn't that a blessing? Yeah. Uh, all right. Jeez, people, come on. <laughs> right? So we're working at, at looking at Laodicea tonight, which is going to be the lukewarm church. So uh, make sure tonight you amen a lot, right? Yeah. Or we're going to all point to you. And we're just going to be like, lukewarm, lukewarm, lukewarm. <laughs> it's going to be really, really embarrassing if you do it. Uh, this, man, I, don't you just love that song we just did? I love it. Uh, a lot of the language that came out of that song uh, comes out of uh, these seven letters. that We're going to uh, sing again the song at the end. But uh, some of the language uh, about gold, a faith that's more precious than gold, uh, the theme of a church that is persecuted, that is worshiping in the midst of struggle, in the midst of grief, in the midst of, uh, of just running the race, uh, that we worship even then in those moments. And I just love that song. I've kind of got lost there for a moment, but I'm back at it. All right, you guys ready? All right, Revelation chapter three, we're gonna start at verse 14. Uh, we're gonna read to verse 22 all together. Uh, well, you guys are gonna read silently. I'm gonna read aloud and you guys can listen to me read. All right, you guys ready? All right. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, this is their perception of themselves. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched uh, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you, may be, that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and slave to anoint, or, or and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this church in Laodicea is getting a letter, and I don't know if you noticed, but there's nothing good in that letter, right? Like that's a hard letter to get where there's no like, well, you're doing this good and you're doing this good. There's none of that in this letter. It's like everything you are doing, it's bad. And it comes right on the hills of uh, the church, uh, the, the, the letter of Philadelphia. So Amos, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, spoke on that, that letter and everything was good and there was nothing bad. So Laodicea, this church is probably like, wow, Philadelphia, they're really doing really good. All right, what does Jesus have to say about us? We're probably just killing it, right? And then all of a sudden he just unloads on them just like there's nothing that you are doing that is, that is working. Like you're wealthy 
And you've got a lot going for you as far as the world is concerned, but man, you are just really dropping the ball in your spirituality. Now, uh, I've mentioned this before, some of the pastoral staff, uh, we went over to Turkey years ago, and when we were there, we went to Laodicea. It's interesting, Laodicea, there was really hardly any excavation that was done at that time. Uh, there was just kind of rolling hills, some sheep grazing, not much going on. Uh, a few different cisterns were kind of poking out the ground. A few different uh, pillars were poking out of the ground. Since that time, which is really interesting, since that time, it's become one of, if not the largest archaeology, uh, uh, archaeologist um, excavation that is in Turkey. And it's just turning into... Uh, them finding so much stuff. I was just looking within the last two months of the stuff that they've found. And it's interesting too that all of the things that they're finding there are just reaffirming so much of what scripture says and of what we already know. And it's just, it's beautiful. Now I've got a couple pictures that I wanna show you. And this is, uh, this is actually a gymnasium. And I've got a few pictures that we're gonna see of just the ruins that I want you guys to see. This is them uh, excavating and kind of sifting through stuff. Uh, this was from uh, a portion where they're looking for the temple that they know is there. The one more picture that I wanna show uh, of that. This is kind of looks at just a big, um, broad view of this. So you can see that um, it's a big area that they're excavating. And they say right now that it's actually only about 30% excavated. So there is a ton, a ton there. Now, this city was, it was a huge city. It was uh, a city that had about, they say at the height of this city was 120,000 people, which is like triple of the other cities that are around in that area. This was a really wealthy city because there were different roads that kind of collided together. Or this, they, they had a juncture together. And so it was a big trade city like a lot of the other cities, but they had done really, really, really well. There was also a lot of pride that the people of Laodicea had in their city. This was known as a throne city. There was uh, a political leader, this king at the time. Uh, this was before Jesus' time. This was uh, in uh, first century BC that uh, rises to power. And as he rises to power, he becomes really famous. And he was actually from Laodicea. So to honor him, they kind of make this a throne city and they uh, kind of make a big deal that this is the hometown of somebody who is really a famous, famous person. Now I've got a map for us to see. And this map is gonna show us, it's down here, Laodicea down here, but look, it's actually close, really, really close to two other cities, Heropolis and Colossae. Colossae is about 10 miles away and Heropolis is about six, five or six miles away. Colossae, that is 10 miles away, that's who Paul writes to, right? Where we get Colossians. And that's uh, it really an interesting thing too because um, Paul is going to write to them um, and we're gonna look at in just a little bit about some real specific views about Jesus. He's calling the church in Colossians to have uh, a, a real high view of Jesus. Uh, a lot of people at that time didn't have a high view of Jesus. They thought, well, maybe he was either just spiritual, just divine, maybe he was just spirit altogether, or maybe he was just a man, which neither of those options uh, both would be considered heresy because we know that Jesus is, uh, he is completely divine and completely man at the same time. And so uh, he, Paul is, is wanting the church there to have a high view of Jesus. And um, we're, we're gonna see in this letter is when we see that first verse in verse 14, that that same thing is, is happening there, that we wanna have a real high view uh, of who Jesus is. Now, in 26 AD, there was, and we, we looked at this when we talked about Smyrna, there was this kind of like a competition or um, this, this, yeah, just like a competition to see who was going to have the honor, this real high honor of having the temple to the emperor built in their city. There were 10 of these cities that were in the running and it was kind of like the Olympics if you got this temple in your city, 
there's all kinds of like commerce. There's all kinds of prestige that's going to come your way. It's like having the Olympics in Bakersfield. Like that would be, like we would just be elated. That's going to bring, we'll probably get another Chick-fil-A. Like who knows? (laughs) Anything is possible, right? They end up losing that and they lose it to Smyrna. But the, the people, the committee who are in charge of that, the reason that they say that Laodicea can't host this uh, empirical temple is because they have insufficient resources. And they are a rich place. And like we're gonna see, they did have some water issues. They didn't have the clean, pure water that they needed. But if somebody tells you that, like, you're basically just not good enough, that kind of puts a chip on your shoulder. So Laodicea has kind of like something to prove at this point. They've, they're just, they don't take it well. And about 30 years later, in AD 60, there's a massive earthquake that wipes out the whole town. It just crumbles the whole town. And just like we see now with the hurricanes that are happening on the East Coast, we see that the government, the federal government will step in most of the time, hopefully, right? And give aid to help rebuild. What we see happening here is the same exact thing. Rome goes to Laodicea and says, man, you're a beautiful city. We're gonna help you guys out. We're gonna give you guys some financing. And you know what Laodicea says? No, thank you. No, thank you. We've got sufficient resources. And they had such a chip on their shoulder from being turned down that uh, for the empirical temple, that they end up coming and they say, no, we, 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 can, we can figure it out. We're self-sufficient. Like we can do things on our own. We don't need to depend on anybody. And they refuse the aid that's coming to them, which is just crazy that they would do that. But they rely on themselves and they rely on their wealth and they rely on their, their riches. Now, there were a few different things that they were really famous for and things that really brought in a whole lot of money uh, to the uh, people of Laodicea. One of those things is just finances and money altogether. They had a banking system, and it was one of the early banking systems that we see comes out of Laodicea. They also were minting their own coins. They weren't depending on Rome for this. They were minting their own coins at this point. These are uh, some coins that they find from Laodicea and from that area. Um, And it's just, it's amazing that they were doing this at that time. They weren't depending on anybody else. They also uh, were really famous for their garments. Their garments that they would make out of wool, but it wasn't just any wool. It was actually a black wool from a black sheep. This is uh, the literally, that's the actual sheep from that time, uh, from 2,000 years ago. Um, They they would had a way uh, with these black sheep of making really, really beautiful clothing. So they had this financial district, but they also had this like, it was a very fashionable place, a place where they took great pride in making the clothes that they wore and people from all over would wanna get these black wool clothes from there. They were also famous for a specific eye medicine. And they would take this Phrygian stone and they would um, crush it up and they would make a powder. And out of that powder, they would make like a salve or a balm. And then it would uh, be taken, put on people's eyes. Uh, This was something that would help people's eyes. Uh, It's even still used today, I've heard or read that it's actually something that people still do. Uh, They were really into medicine, specifically for eyes. There was somebody that lived in the the town of Laodicea that wrote a book on on eye care, and it actually was in circulation and used for 1,500 years. So this, this was a place that they really took a whole lot of pride in clothing, on finances, and on their medicine. They were also known for their aqueduct system. Their aqueduct system uh, was a a really big deal because they didn't have uh, great water in Laodicea. Now, we mentioned before there's this triad of of these three cities. So uh, Heropolis, Colossae, and uh, is to the south, and Laodicea that's in the middle. To the north is uh, Heropolis. So uh, they figured, hey, we don't have great water here, so what we're going to do 
is we're going to have this aqueduct built. And they had this aqueduct go all the way down south to Colossae. It's like south, southeast. And they, it's about a six mile aqueduct that is a huge undertaking to pipe all this water in. And this water comes from this mountain called Mount Cadmus. And that's the mountain right there. And it actually stays snow capped for like 10 or 11 months out of the year. There's just always some cold, fresh water that's coming from there. Uh, the problem is it's a really, it takes a really long time for that to get there. And by the time that the water that was really nice and cold in Colossae would make its way down or make its way up to them, uh, it was not cold anymore. It was tempid, it was lukewarm, lukewarm. Uh, they also would get water from another source. And uh, here's a picture, and that might look like snow right here, but this isn't actually snow. That's actually uh, minerals uh, that are making the ground really white. And Heropolis to the north had uh, mineral springs. And so they would get water from the mineral springs, but as the water would come down, uh, it would come and it would mix in with the cool water. And it usually, because it was so full of, of mineral, had a horrible taste and a horrible smell. Uh, and a lot of times they couldn't drink it. And, it. and even though it was really hot, by the time it made it down south, that six miles to Laodicea, it wasn't hot anymore. It was lukewarm. It was just gross, smelly water, right? So when we think of Laodicea, it's this place that um, they had a lot of good things going for them. It's a place where they were trying so hard. They had good economics. They had good like ideas to like run after, like chase the markets or like, uh, you know, go after different economies or different resources or different commodities. But it was uh, a place that um, spiritually they were in a really, really bad place bad place. And I think this is going to be really um, relevant tonight to us because in a lot of ways, I think that's the American spirit, right? That we want to like go for number one, like get out there, like make it happen, which works in the market, but doesn't always work inside the doors of a church. And it works sometimes outside, but it doesn't always work inside our hearts because we're not supposed to just be uh, self-dependent people or we're not supposed to be people that just rely on ourselves. When it comes to our Christian walk, we're supposed to be people that surrender all to Jesus, who rely completely on Jesus. And so here he is. In the first verse, like all the others, he's going to identify himself in a very unique and a special way. So in verse 14 of chapter three, he says, and to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the words of the amen. What is the amen? The amen, we say that when we pray, right? We all say amen, which is so be it, or let this be true. So he's saying here, the words of the one who is true, the truth. The faithful and true witness. Now remember at this time, witness was kind of synonymous or used for the word martyr. He is the faithful and true martyr, the one who laid down his life for the sins of the world. So he's, he's saying who he is. And he says uh, also the beginning of God's creation, the beginning of God's creation. Now earlier I kind of referred to this, but it's interesting to me that they are so close to Colossae and something is happening in this region because Paul's gonna write to them and he's gonna say this in Colossians chapter one, he's gonna say he, and he's speaking about Jesus, he is the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Very similar language, isn't it? For, him, for by him all things were created. So he's showing the, the divinity of Christ, that he is not just a man. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is a high view of Christ and who Christ is. 
And Jesus is saying the same things here about himself as he's addressing. He's reminding the people of Laodicea who he is. He's saying, I need you to remember this, that I'm not just a guy, I'm not just another teacher, but I am the amen, the truth. I am the one who died for the sins of the world. I am the one who is eternal. You know, Jesus is, he is co-equal with God the Father. He is co-eternal with God the Father. He is part of the Godhead, the triune God. He's not just somebody that comes along later in the story. Scripture is telling us right here that he's been there the whole time. God, the Son, the second person of the Godhead. And so we gotta think about that a little bit and, and say, God, give me that high view of who you are. Give me a high view of Jesus. He's not just created, he's not just another being. Now remember, Laodicea is made up of two Greek words, meaning the rule of the people. Two Greek words meaning rule and meaning people. And it's this really ironic thing. It's these people who are kind of saying like, no, we are the ones who are in charge. We are the ones who rule. It's our opinion that matters. And the problem is that they're doing that same thing with Jesus. They're doing that same exact thing with Jesus. They're saying like, no, Jesus is what we want him to be. Jesus, you know, our, our, our opinion of Jesus, it can change. It can be here one day and here another day. Jesus can be this or Jesus can be this. And he's just a made up construct of our minds. And Jesus is saying, no, like this is who I am. I'm the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last. I'm the one who created the world. I created you. And he's reminding them who he is. So this, is, this letter is starting out even in the first verse with all kinds of authority. Starting off with, man, this is who I am and I'm supreme and I am, I am the one. I'm Jesus. So we go into verse 15. It says, I know your works. That word know there is not just like I've seen them or I've heard about them. It's this really like I know everything about them. I know them intimately. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were hot, either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. That is some strong language here. Jesus isn't sad. Jesus isn't looking at the church of Laodicea and he's mad at them. He's literally sick when he looks at them. Just as an aside here tonight, like if, if Jesus tells you that, that's, that's, a, that's bad. That's bad. If, if he looks at you and says, I look at your works I look where you're at, I look at what you're doing as a church, and he's saying it, it just makes me sick. Like I literally wanna just, I just wanna vomit out of my mouth. So he's saying like, man, I don't want you to be lukewarm. I don't know if maybe you've been in the church a long time and in, in church, like we can go through seasons in our relationship and our journey with, with Jesus. There's times when we're in the desert and there's times when we're in just the land of the plentiful where we're just receiving the blessings of God. Wherever you're at tonight, can I just give you like some pastoral direction tonight? Do not be lukewarm. Like wherever you find yourself in whatever season you are in, be zealous for the things of God and the kingdom of God. Don't be temp tempted. Don't be nominal. Don't be numb to the things of God. Don't be numb to the spirit of God, to the whisper of God. And that's what he's, he's saying. Like, man, right now, like the things you're doing, they're just lukewarm. There's no purpose behind it. You're just going through the motions. Chapter three, verse 17 and 18 go on. It says, uh, for you say, and this is their perspective. He's saying like, you say this about yourself. I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. 
not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable. And look at these right here. Remember the three kind of commodities, right? Or the three areas of the Laodicean church or city that they've got finances, um, that they've got garment, a garment industry and a textile industry, and uh, that there are people who have medicine specifically for the eyes. He's gonna say that, no, this is the truth. Like you are poor, you are blind, and you are naked. Like, can you get more specific than that? Like he's telling these people, like you think in one area that you are just doing so great, but you are far from great. And so he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. He's saying this, you have run to everything else out there, trying to lean on yourself, thinking that your money can save you, your money can help you, like your businesses can help you. And he's saying, what I really want is I want you to come to me, run to me. I'm your creator, run to me. You are spiritually bankrupt. You can have all the money and be spiritually broke. He's saying, run to me, buy it from me, come to me. I want to be the one that you depend on. I want to be the one that you lean on. I want to be the one that, that you just, man, when things are horrible and upside down and things are broken, that you don't just go automatically and look to your bank account. I want to, I want to be the one, you look to me, you come, to, I want to be your father. Amen. And before we judge them, before we look at them and say like, I can't believe that they would do that, I think we have to look at ourselves, right? Because I think we do that all the time. Like I can fall prey to this so fast. And I think especially men, like we want to fix things so bad. And it's hard to even listen to people's problems and just to listen to them without trying to find a solution, right? Wives, we're, we're just trying to think, well, why didn't you do this and this and this? And, and our wives say, just listen for a moment. And we're like, we can't. I want to just fix it and make it better, right? And I can fall into that trap so much where instead of relying on the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and the discernment of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that I can rely just on my training and just on my instinct. Like it's so easy to even go into meetings with people and you sit down with people sometimes and it's like, man, I haven't even prayed about this meeting and there's serious implications on the line and maybe I just like was so busy that I just ran right into the meeting and didn't even pray, Holy Spirit, would you guide my words? Would you guide my thoughts? Would you guide and bring wisdom to this? And sometimes I can just rely on myself thinking, you know what, I'm smart enough to figure this out. It's so easy with, with my kids when something's wrong, just to say like, oh, you know what, it's just, it's a problem to be fixed and I can figure out this problem. Instead of saying, Jesus, I need you as the Holy Spirit, can you please help me to be a better father? Like help me where I can't help myself. Sometimes we can just have this attitude, especially in America, that just money fixes everything. And we can fall back on that or run back to that. So what's his counsel? What's, what does he say, like what's the counsel that he would give? Let's look at this next verse. He's gonna say, those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. So be zealous and repent. Oh man, that, those that he loves, he disciplines. We hate discipline, don't we? We hate it so much. But he's just saying, man, like, trust in my wisdom. Put your hope and your confidence in me, run to me, not just the things of the world. You don't need just riches. You need spiritual riches. Come and buy gold for me. Come and buy this faith that is more precious than gold. You need righteousness. You don't need just black, beautiful garments. You need to be clothed in righteousness. You don't just need this medicine from this world. You need this spiritual sight. That though you're, you, you might have physical sight, 
You need spiritual sight. So what if, what if maybe um, for us, maybe like we come to church and we come in here and we go through life thinking that we have all these problems. What if the biggest problem we have is not actually a money problem, but it's a spiritual problem? Like what if, what if, what if our spirituality, what if there's a heart issue that God's wanting to fix and we're just trying to fix it with our hands? Like, what if we're just chasing our tail around so much and leaning on our own understanding and leaning on our own giftings and our own talents? And the whole time, maybe there's this voice of the Holy Spirit that's just saying, hey, man, come to me. Are you weary? Come to me. Are you broken? I I just want to restore you. Do you need rest? I'd love to give you rest right now. Are you just confused and you don't know which way to go? Like, come to me, I have wisdom for you. I'll give it to you generously when, when you ask and when you seek me. Maybe some of the biggest problems in our lives, because it's hard to think of a bigger problem sometimes than money, isn't it? Or maybe the biggest problem in our life isn't just this a relationship or a job or a coworker. Maybe, maybe the biggest issues that we have in our lives could be fixed if we would allow the great physician, the true physician, Amen. to do heart surgery on us, Amen. to correct us. So in verse 20 of chapter three, he's gonna say this, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Like behold, I'm standing at the door and knock, knocking. Remember this. Like I was talking uh, with somebody earlier about this, but I, I think it's important that we remember that this is written to the church. Like a lot of times we wanna use this um, in an evangelical way. And I don't think that's horrible or bad uh, or that it's, um, heresy or whatever. I don't, I don't think that that's the case. But remember who he's writing to. He's writing to the church. Yeah, that's right. And he's not just saying, because a lot of times we use this in a context that would say, you need to come to Jesus for salvation and he's knocking at the door of your heart. But just remember this immediate context right here. Jesus is speaking to a church He's saying, I want to be in there and I'm not in there and you've locked me out and I'm knocking on the door. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? This isn't our church. This is his church. Can you imagine locking him out of his own church and him knocking on the, this is the most terrifying verse in scripture for me right now. Thinking about this. That Jesus, the creator of the world, this is his church. And for him to be looking at us and saying like, man, I would love to be inside. I would love to move in your midst. I would love to heal people. I would love to, to, to come in through the power of the Holy Spirit and just move. But I'm here on the outside and I don't think anybody's even noticed that I've been locked out. Have you ever been locked out of somewhere and everybody inside's having fun and nobody even knows that you're outside? and you're texting all the people trying to get in. And sometimes have we, have we kept him on the outside? I wanna say this, like open the door, open the door and let the King of glory in. Let him into your life, let Jesus in. He's at the door knocking at his own church. So when do we do that? When do we keep him out? I think we do it when we're prayerless, when, we're, when we just don't pray. I mean, there's so many times where when we pray, it's just over our food. How many of you have prayed over your food and you're like, wow, like, really, that's the last time I prayed. I think it's easy to fall into this just pattern of trying to do things on our own and not resting in him. Not saying, Jesus, would you come into the problems 
the frustrations, the tensions in my marriage. Like Jesus, would you come in? Would you sanctify my marriage? Would you make it whole? I can't do it on my own. I can't figure it out. Jesus, would you come in to my relationship with my kids? Well, maybe God, you are the only one that can fix it. Maybe God, would you come into my, just the situation with my health? God, I can't fix it. I, I've tried to go to every doctor. I've tried to go to every specialist. I've tried to have x-rays of every body part that I could have and I still can't figure this out. God, would you come and would you be the great physician? I wanna rely on you. Maybe we're at this place where we need to invite him in, invite him in. So verse 19 that we read by, I think gives us kind of the remedy. It's, it's saying, this is, how, this is how you move forward. This is what you do. And it's gonna tell us this, if we look at verse 19 again, those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. We've gotta say, God, man, discipline me. It's not the funnest thing. It's not the coolest thing to talk about, but scripture says he disciplines those he loves. Today I had a call from my four-year-old, not from my four-year-old, from my wife saying I needed to come discipline my four-year-old. I had to drive up here to the church and I had to discipline him. He's only four years old, but he was starting a mutiny in his class and it was time for them to come in from recess and he encouraged the kids to know if we all run and play, they can't catch us, you know? <laughs> My mom drove by and she was like, oh, hey. And I was like, it's not a good time. This is a bad time right now. I love him so much, but if I just neglect disciplining my kid, he's gonna end up, who knows? He's gonna end up, you know, Shopping at Target. I don't know what he's gonna end up doing. Something bad, right? He disciplines those he loves. So he's telling us here, like, accept my discipline. When um, so many times when we feel anything we don't like or any discomfort, we automatically try to rebuke it and push it away and say, like, no, get out of here, Satan. I think some of those times it's the loving voice of God just saying, hey, I've got to correct you here. And that's why we need to be people that are full of the Holy Spirit so we can discern those moments when, when, when the Spirit is speaking to us and saying, hey, I need you to take a different path here. I need you to correct the way that you're perceiving me. I need you to correct the way you're perceiving other people, that you're relating to other people, the way that you're talking. We need the Holy Spirit so much in our lives even to have the discipline and to receive it well. And then he's gonna tell us that you've gotta repent. You've gotta turn from just relying on the world, just relying on our, our bank accounts, just relying on the things of this life. You've gotta turn from that and start relying first and foremost on me. You've gotta put some action to that. It's not just feeling sorry for it, but literally turning and going the other way. And then we wanna have zeal. Uh, so many times when we hear zealous, it's in a negative uh, way. We say, oh, that person, oh, they're just a little too zealous, right? Or that person, zeal is a good thing. It means like being serious about something or taking something extremely serious or being focused on it um, or having passion, having passion uh, when doing that task. I wanna be zealous for the Lord. I wanna be zealous in how I worship. And it's easy to come in here and think worship is about us. And it's easy to be like, man, it's too loud. I don't know the words, which is fine because it's, it's not for us. It's not, it's for him. It's for him. Tonight, can we just remember that? We can have zeal in worship because it's not for us, it's for him. It's for him. So be zealous in everything we do. Be zealous in how we pray. Be zealous in how we worship. Be zealous for the word of God. Accept his discipline. Repent and be zealous. So I wanna ask tonight, if you were just to um, close your eyes maybe right now, you don't have to, but if, if you're just to kind of think deeply in your soul, how's your temperature? 
how is, how's the temperature of your soul? The temperature of your faith? Is it burning hot? Or is it lukewarm? Have you found yourself kind of maybe in your spiritual walk kind of like in slow motion? Is there no urgency to it, to your walk, to your prayer, to spending time with God? Has maybe his prayer or times in worship or times in the word become a chore to you? Maybe you're just like, man, oh, I just gotta cut out this time for God. And it's become just an inconvenience. Or is it the joy of your day, the gift of your day? Where's your hope? Is your hope in other things? Or is your hope in Jesus? Let's stand together if you would. Before we close, I just wanna read this last portion. I love the structure of these, starting with just a personal reminder of who Jesus is. We see in all the books, or all the letters, almost all of them have encouragement and almost all of them have some kind of, um, some kind of correction in them. All of them have like, man, this is what you need to do to walk in repentance. And they all have um, this just beautiful promise to those who follow this and walk this out, to those who are overcomers or victorious, uh, there's, there's a promise for you. Now, remember, this is, uh, this is a throne city. They are taking very seriously uh, the, the honor and the authority that they have because of the people that have come from their city. And Jesus says this to them, uh, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And then he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. I love that. The throne that Jesus, the place and the position that he has for you is better than anything that this world has to offer. Anything that this world has to offer. When Jesus exalts, when Jesus lifts up, it's better than anything in this world. Amen? Amen. Jesus, we come to you. We love you so much. And we just pray right now that you would awaken our souls with zeal and with passion for your name. Jesus, would you help us to awake and to shake off the slumber of this world? That we would have passion to worship you and to pray and to grow in our discipleship and our relationship with you. Jesus, would you help us to just wake from our slumber would you shake us and would you awaken our souls tonight? Jesus, I pray that we would not be lukewarm people, that we wouldn't be people who are just numb to the things of God, but we would be alive in you. God, we look to you and we run to you, not to the things of this world, but first, always we run to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We lift up our eyes to you. We fix our eyes on you, Jesus, the one who is the amen, the one who was there before creation, the one who is the true witness. God, we look to you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you so much that you love us and we place our hope and our confidence in you. And in Jesus' name, all God's people say, amen, amen.